Hello everybody and welcome to this talk about my new book which is called uh, Looking Out and it's uh, published by Parthian. I'm really sorry I can't um, take the book out and about and uh, meet you in person uh, presenting the book in uh, lectures which is what I had planned to do um, but of course the virus has put an end to that uh, but I hope nevertheless you'll find what I've got to say today uh, of interest. Over the past 35 years uh, in writing about visual culture in Wales, um, I've been concerned mainly with doing two things. Firstly, um, revealing the existence of what was when I began, um, uh, the existence of uh, a, a largely hidden, uh, invisible um, body of paintings and sculptures and visual ephemera that relate to the broader uh, uh, evolution of the cultures of Wales. The second concern uh, that I've had has been to suggest ways of understanding those works uh, so as to reveal their significance for us. I suppose the shorthand uh, description for all this is um, constructing a tradition. However, the first words in my new book are not, in fact, my own. Um, they are the words of that remarkable writer, John Berger, who in 1966, which is a resonant year for me because it's the year I went to university to study art. Uh, in 1966, um, Berger wrote an essay called The Historical Function of the Museum. And in that essay, he said this. If the application of ideas to the understanding of art implies propaganda, that is indeed what I am proposing. Now, it was a characteristically provocative and challenging statement, and because by then the word propaganda had already long acquired the sense which it um, uh, maintains to this day, um, which is essentially lies. But this was in fact a remarkable distortion of the original uh, meaning of the word, which was simply to propose a system of thought, or to put it even more simply, as Berger would famously do himself um, rather later on, uh, to propose a way of seeing things. Now, I think that precision of meaning uh, in the use of words is fundamentally important in uh, the presentation of ideas. Like that of John Berger, uh, the motivation for all my own writing has been propaganda, proposing a way of seeing things. And then that, in the end, uh, for me, means expressing a political philosophy. So I want to be clear about it. Um, the books that I've written uh, have not been essentially about a way of seeing art, uh, but about a way of seeing Wales. Art happens to be the thing that I know something about. Uh, and so that's been the vehicle uh, to carry the underlying idea. And central to the promotion of uh, uh, that idea has been to address what I see as the crippling lack of self-confidence, um, which over decades, hundreds of years really, has held us back from achieving our potential as a society. It's become what often seems to be the congenital condition of our psyche. And in all the fields of artistic expression, it's certainly in visual culture um, that that lack of self-confidence has had its most damaging uh, impact. To put it another way, um, I've often remarked, some of you may have heard me say this before, that I'm not particularly interested in art. That's true. But I am very interested in what art does. How it both reflects and affects uh, the wider world around us. That's what this book, like all my other books, is about. Now, when I first started to write, there uh, emerged a vocabulary of objection, of uh, opposition to the focus on Wales in my work, which was constantly deployed against what I was trying to do. My attitude was called uh, parochial, provincial, inward looking, backward looking, reactionary, even fascist on a couple of occasions. Well, that vocabulary has largely faded uh, from the public discourse by now, though make no mistake about it, there are still plenty of people out there in Wales who would like to bring it back if the zeitgeist uh, permitted. But in fact, underlying what I've written uh, has always been a state of mind that is, I hope, the very opposite of parochial 
In what I've written, I have always been intensely mindful of parallels and exemplars uh, in other places and other cultures. Respect for one's own sense of cultural location can't be expected without an equivalent respect for the cultural location of others. And that means trying to understand the way of seeing of others and sympathetically measuring our own experiences against theirs, both in terms of commonalities and of differences. It means respecting uh, and celebrating difference, uh, our own and that of others. Now, some three years ago, when my volume, The Tradition, was published, I began to think about what to do next. And it seemed to me that the time was right to make this interest in the cultural location of others more apparent in a discussion of our own visual heritage. Hence the title of my new book. And if you'll just bear with me uh, a second, I'll uh, try and uh, get up some pictures on the screen that we can look at. I hope the technology behaves itself. I think it's going to. Uh, yes, there we are. Um, so here it is, the new book, uh, Looking Out. It remains a book um, focused on Welsh painting. And in addition to dealing with the international context of our own products, it deals with another important issue for us, and that is the relationship between social class and visual culture. But in the course of each discussion, I've tried to make explicit some of the international comparisons that it seems to me have particular relevance to our own experience. And indeed, in many cases, have uh, had a direct bearing on work produced by Welsh image makers and on the perception uh, of their work by critics. And it's that aspect of the book which I want to concentrate on today. So let's begin, if we can, with two paintings from the mid 19th century. Both are pictures of women in middle age and both were painted by men. Now we don't know the name of the lady on the left, uh, but the lady on the right is called Elizabeth Wadeson. The pictures are closely contemporary in date, as you can see from the clothes the women wear and their hairstyles. And we can see also um, that the women are likely to be of similar social class, social standing. Finally, and importantly, for what I want to point out in this particular comparison, the pictures have been painted in a very similar way. There's been no attempt to create a realistic material world beyond the chairs on which they sit, for instance. And the clear, hard lines and colours of the paintwork display more of an interest in the decorative potential of the surfaces uh, of the women's clothes and, and, and their faces, than in creating a sense of uh, three-dimensional depth. It's fair to say also uh, that the women have been presented as being somewhat severe. Here's another art historian's description of the work of the painter of the picture on the left, whose name was Sheldon Peck. This is what he says. The severe countenances that recur in Peck's work seem uncharitable to modern eyes. Yet such images were, do, were deemed fitting in a culture that carefully codified the rules of deportment and propriety, and sitters expected their portraits to show their diligence, prosperity, and status as effectively as they captured their likeness. Now that description is quoted from a massive tome called the Encyclopedia of American Folk Art, which includes a substantial entry about the painter. Sheldon Peck is celebrated uh, a celebrated figure in the American art tradition. And his work is widely reproduced in books. Uh, his pictures sell for high prices on the art market. Um, this particular example is on display to the public at the Henry Sheldon Museum in Vermont. And I'd like to thank the museum for permission to reproduce the picture. Now the observations made about the relationship between the nature of the portrait painted by Sheldon Peck and the culture from which it emerged apply equally well uh, to the portrait on the right, the portrait of Elizabeth Wadeson. However, here the comparison turns from similarity to contrast. The portrait of Elizabeth Wadeson is not on display in a public museum, and there's no entry on the painter, who was called William H. Chapman, uh, in any monograph or encyclopedia, or even in an essay, apart from my own. And the reason for this is that the sitter was Welsh, and she was painted in Wales. Elizabeth was born at Betus Cadewa in Montgomeryshire, and at the time she was painted, when she was in her early 40s, she kept the Lion Inn at Berriel near Welshpool. Still there, and looks pretty much the same from the outside as it did when she was there. She just had her first child. 
and that event is probably noted in the picture by the pink rose on the table. It's an ancient symbol in art of the innocence of uh, female, young female children. Her portrait represents an artistic practice and a source of patronage that is of fundamental importance in Wales, but that's considered irrelevant in the English high art context in which almost all art history has been written uh, for centuries. The painter, William H. Chapman, was like his American contemporary, Sheldon Pegg, an itinerant artisan. That's to say, a professional painter, but one who had not had an academic training in art and who moved from place to place uh, to find his patrons. His sitter was representative of the middle class inhabitants of small towns like Welshpool, where itinerant artisans found uh, most of their clients. And when he painted Wadeson, in fact, Chapman had been working quite recently in Wrexham, as you can see from this newspaper advertisement. Now, the question that arises from the comparison is what accounts for the huge difference in status between uh, two pictures that are in many ways so similar? The answer lies in having the confidence to define and celebrate a tradition of painting that does not simply reflect the values of metropolitan high art tradition. Until the Great War, uh, most American artists and critics continued to believe that European academic art, whether it's in London or Paris or Rome, represented a high point of world civilization. After the Great War, that perception changed and a tradition of American painting was constructed that, among other things, had the confidence to celebrate the work of artisans like Sheldon Peck. The lesson to be drawn from the American example is to ignore the conventional wisdom, a conventional wisdom that marginalizes and devalues our cultural artifacts, and to find a new way of seeing them. In this case, it means validating the painting, not in terms of uh, English academic art, but in terms of the meaning and significance of the work within the particular culture from which it emerged. In the case of paintings like the portrait of Elizabeth Wadeson, made in the middle of the 19th century, that means the culture of a middle class, substantially non-conformist in religion, that was a driving force in forging the identity of Wales. As in the United States, it's as important and fundamental as that. Another interesting parallel uh, between artisan painting in the United States and in Wales is that the painter, William H. Chapman, was the son of another itinerant painter, William Jones Chapman. And in fact, William Jones Chapman is far more important to us uh, than his son. Uh, his son arrived uh, on the scene after the invention of photography, which was a development that would undermine the portrait painting practices, practices of his father's generation, painters like um, Hugh Hughes and William Roos. Between 1830 and the 1870s, William Jones Chapman painted dozens of portraits, as well as equestrian pictures and some landscapes in Wales. And it's pretty clear that it was he who taught his son to paint, reflecting a tradition of transmission of craft skills within a family of which there are several well-documented examples in the United States. So in a second comparison, this time between William H. Chapman's portrait of Elizabeth Wadeson, painted in 1859, and a portrait painted by his father, um, uh, 20 years earlier, we can see clearly the source of the son's style and technique. Uh, this lady, displaying a, an impressive array of bling, uh, was painted at the other end of Wales, in fact, in Carmarthenshire in 1839. Now, from the same artisan tradition, here are two very large portraits painted by Evan Williams, who came originally from Sedrod in, Carn in uh, Cardiganshire, but who worked for most of his career in Carnarvon. They were painted in 1877, which is very late in the period dominated by artisan painters. The sitters are John and Ellen Jones of Bryn Rodin, which was a Calvinistic chapel, a Calvinistic Methodist chapel uh, at a Groyslon just outside Carnarvon. And that's where John Jones was for many years, uh, the minister. Now such portraits celebrating ministers of religion, uh, often as in this case, uh, commissioned by their congregations, uh, they're a common feature of our tradition. More unusually, the painter, Evan Williams, uh, was himself also a minister. Now, they're remarkably striking portraits, and much of their clarity and precision is due, in technical terms at any rate, to the fact that before his vocation changed the course of his career, Evan Williams had trained and worked as a coach painter. And the comparison here 
is with perhaps the most celebrated of all uh, the American artisans, Edward Hicks, who was also trained as a coach painter and who again, um, like Williams, was a devout nonconformist, a Quaker in his case. Now we know quite a lot about Evan Williams um, because in addition to painting, he wrote extensively in the Welsh language about art. In fact, he was the first person uh, to do so in a sustained and detailed way. And he also wrote about religious and social issues. We also uh, know a considerable amount about the circumstances of the commission of these particular portraits and a great deal about the sitters. Like many other uh, of his prominent contemporaries, John Jones was the subject of a substantial memoir, a memoir, a memoir which also informs us about Ellen Jones. But the memoir belongs to a genre of Welsh language literature, the ministerial coviant, which does much more than simply tell us about an individual life, a, a single story. The Covianite celebrate a culture, a way of seeing things, uh, a way of seeing the world that for a long period, in fact, would be at the root of a particular Welsh identity, both for those who felt themselves within it, like John Jones, and those who characterise Welshness from the outside, often unfavourably. Now, I see these portraits as a visual extension of that genre, almost as if in riposte to the naturalism of the photograph. Evan Williams portrayed his sitters with a, a kind of super real clarity, brilliantly lit, uh, as if to symbolize the light of the gospel preached by, uh, by John Jones and by other ministers who sat to Evan Williams. He elaborated his portraits with only a, a minimum of extraneous uh, detail, which might distract from the very unrelenting examination that he undertook of the faces of his sitters. Williams, in fact, dignified the portrait of John Jones uh, simply by means of a pale and symbolic classical column in the background, um, reflecting the columns that adorned the frontages of many of the newly built chapels in which men like him laboured. Theirs was a rational religion. That's what that uh, symbol of the classical column is meant to say to us. These portraits were moralities. They're works that sought to encapsulate and propagate values that those which commissioned them uh, with, with which those that commissioned them identified. They felt themselves a, a part of that value system. Now, as we've already seen, relevant international comparisons don't always depend on similarities, uh, like the parallel with artisan painting in the United States. And it happens that in 1877, the year in which Evan Williams painted the portraits of John and Ellen Jones, a few hundred miles away in Paris, uh, Edward Manet painted the portrait of a well-known young woman called Henriette Horsa whom he re renamed Nana. And that was a word which at the time had the com connotation in popular culture of a courtesan or a prostitute. Not only was her portrait painted in a very different way uh, from that of uh, Ellen or John Jones, but the worlds they portray seem really utterly remote one from another. Nevertheless, they might be said to share one characteristic, which is the importance of their moral content. Now, while that moral content is implicit in the portraits painted by Williams of a respected Methodist minister and his pious wife, that of the Manet painting takes the form of an explicit visual narrative conveyed in the focus of a fully dressed gentleman's stare uh, at the backside of the young lady standing coquettishly in high heels and underwear. However, in this case, the comparison between these works is important not so much for what the pictures meant to their respective audiences in their own times, as for the implications of how they've been perceived subsequently in terms of the history of Western art. To put it simply, the Manet painting is famous, very famous, but not only famous for itself as a provocative image of an aspect of Parisian life in its period, and that's fair enough, it's famous for its representative place in the narrative of mainstream art history as taught and displayed in museums throughout the Western world. Now the justification for this second basis of its celebrity is considerably more dubious. None of the portrait paintings of Evan Williams of Carnarvon is famous. They don't have a place, no place whatsoever in the mainstream narrative of art history. But as a consequence of the unchallenged acceptance in Wales of that narrative as the only and universal validation of art, neither are they celebrated or even accorded a visible place 
in the histories of the culture from which they emerged. The absence of authoritative validation, indeed, the contempt with which uh, the kind of art they represent has been regarded by almost all of the museum creators, the, the critics and the historians who are the assessors of artistic value, has been profoundly damaging to this nation's self-esteem and confidence in its cultural identities. Now, I think that we should contest the received wisdom, which for all times and all places values Manes Nana more highly than the challenging sobriety uh, of Evan Williams's contemporary portraits of John and Ellen Jones of Bryn Rodin. I think we should contest the exclusivity, which is the consequence of the universal claims made for pictures like Nana, that in some way they represent high points in Western cultures, that their value and significance is greater than that of the products of the cultures of small nations and identities outside the mainstream of the European imperial nations of France and Germany and England. It's an exclusivity that devalues and indeed has been deployed to invalidate artifacts that express cultures such as our own that are marginal to the conventional stories of Western art history. Now, this isn't a matter of the promotion of the values of the community to which Evan Williams and Ellen belonged as being particularly worthy or as a basis for the understandings by which we live now. Today, um, to those like myself for whom the very vocabulary of evangelical Christianity is problematic, the period through which Evan Williams lived marked the passage of the nation into a tragic cul-de-sac that would condemn Wales to political impotence within Britain for the greater part of two centuries. And abroad, it tainted the nation by association with the British imperial project, which scarred the civilization that those who promoted it believed that they were progressing. But harsh judgments of the beliefs and behaviors of the ancestors no more justify the abandonment of the cultural artifacts of our past and their present, the music and the literature and the painting that they made, than do conventional constructs of art history. Honoring the work of Evan Williams and his contemporaries isn't a matter of asserting the rectitude of their beliefs, but of recognition and acknowledgement of their expression through the arts of values promoted by many among the people that we were. And in fact, regret at the consequences of some of those values may be part of the continuing emotional and intellectual impact of their painting and their song and their poetry. However, the reality is that such impacts can only be experienced through a sense of the philosophical uh, and spiritual framework within which the artifacts were created. And this does present a serious difficulty in a nation whose history is so little understood. Now, one of the things we might say about Manet's portrait is that in general terms, it seems more naturalistic or even realistic uh, than the Evan Williams portraits. <clears throat> and there's good evidence to be found for that in the mainstream art historical narrative, which sets up the work of the painter Gustave Courbet uh, as a precursor to Manet. This is perhaps Courbet's most famous painting, a picture that caused a furore uh, when it was presented to the public uh, for the first time in Paris in 1850. It's a huge painting and it depicts a funeral. It's called a burial at Ornon. It caused a row because it followed the formal conventions of academic history or subject painting, or high art, but it critiqued them at the same time by inserting into the composition, not idealized beautiful women mourning the loss perhaps of an angelic child, but representatives of poverty and deprivation, observed at a real and a contemporary event in all its superficial ugliness. This was indeed propaganda, the presentation of a way of seeing the world, and it was given the name realism. Now the date of this painting of a funeral in France is particularly resonant for us in Wales. It was also in 1850 that a painting of a Welsh funeral that would eventually acquire really quite iconic status, was exhibited for the first time. The painter was David Cox, and it was a version of an image which survives in at least six examples, and on which he'd been working for some three years. It probably, in fact, just predates the Courbet. Like the Courbet picture, a Welsh funeral is a record of an actual event observed by the painter. Now, David Cox had worked in Wales since about 1805, but in the mid-1840s, he developed a close relationship with the village of Betasokoid, 
where it became his habit to return uh, every summer to paint. As a result of his high status in the English art world and his ability as a teacher, he attracted a substantial number of admirers to join him at Better Sequoid. Uh, and they formed very quickly uh, the core of what became the first artist colony in Britain. Now, many of the early visitors stayed at the Royal Oak at Betus, and it's the funeral of the daughter of the landlord uh, at that inn that Cox depicted. The topography of the scene accords pretty well with the view from the village towards the old church as it was then, and we can say that it was on the whole pretty realistic. The most significant feature of Cox's picture, uh, which it shares with the Courbet, is that it presents the common people rather than the wealthy and the privileged. And in that respect, it reflects a growing concern amongst intellectuals throughout Europe about the deteriorating condition of the poorest in society. In England, it was a concern uh, expressed, for instance, in the novels of George Eliot, who remarked in 1856 that painters who depicted the people that she described as the masses, the peasantry and the proletariat were still under the influence of idyllic literature. Well, not so Cox, whose picture she particularly admired, she tells us that. So the similarities between Cox's Welsh funeral and the Courbet picture are to an extent explicable if we see them as the expression of this wider angst among intellectuals of the period. Given that Courbet's picture is a foundation work in the movement defined by mainstream art history as realism, should we not also think of Cox's picture, Cox's Welsh picture, in those terms? Indeed, it's not difficult to argue that in a straightforward sort of way, um, Cox's picture is more realistic than the Courbet, since uh, the French picture is composed in a highly uh, theatrical manner. And the reason for this is that Courbet was making a point not only about poverty and deprivation, but also about art, about how poverty and deprivation is to be represented. It was a complaint against academic tradition. Now, that's not the case with the Cox picture. And there are significant differences of response between his work and that of Courbet. Cox's Welsh funeral is certainly realistic, but it is not realism. In fact, it's a picture laden with symbolism, and we have Cox's own confirmation of that. On the right, uh, two children they're sitting on top of the wall there on the lower right of the picture, and they drop flowers into the apron of another child. Cox's biographer recalled the painter himself saying that you must not think that these are common field flowers. Oh no, they are poppies symbolical of the sleep of death. And the biographer continued like this. The golden evening light falls on the upper part of the church, a type of the bright home in heaven. It also illumines that portion of the hills not shaded by the rising mists. This is a picture that displays empathy uh, with the poor, but more fundamentally, it is a picture about faith. Faith in a better place beyond and above, symbolised by the light striking the bell tower. The funeral is a procession leading us away and towards that high illuminated place, symbolised also by the more distant light uh, on the Welsh mountaintops. The painter himself, the old man at the rear of the procession, travels that same road. And this is in complete contrast to the Courbet, in which poverty is confrontational and the Christian symbol as a crucifix in the background, which expresses much more the brutality of human behaviour than the hope of salvation. This too is propaganda. But most important for us is the fact that the title of the work makes explicit that this is a Welsh funeral, because the picture, especially after it was engraved in 1862 and achieved very wide circulation, fed into the hugely influential notion promoted by our intelligentsia of the particular piety of the common people of Wales. The picture simultaneously reinforced and developed the linkage made between the piety of the common people and the mountain landscape in which many of them lived in the northwest of the country. It intensified and refocused the dominant art image of Wales as a mountain landscape that had developed through the second half of the 18th century by linking Welsh mountain landscape with the trope of Welsh piety. Now this notion of the particular piety of the Welsh people is the same that was promoted in a different way uh, and specifically for home consumption in the portraits painted by Evan Williams and by the extensive 
uh, writing uh, that he left us on the subject. And here's William's writing in 1855, for example. This is what he says. There's no need to fear the perceptions of any visiting strangers of the character and practices of the working classes of our country. With the support of heaven, the poor Welsh have filled their country with places of worship and sustained their religion and raised themselves up in character and respect without the support of the powerful, but entirely through their own faith and diligence. The celebrity of Cox's image spawned a genre of related Welsh pictures, and in particular those painted by his successor as the leading figure in the artist's colony, Clarence Waite. Here is his own dramatic interpretation of the Welsh funeral called To the Cold Earth, and a variation on the, Welsh, uh, on the theme of Welsh piety uh, called God's Acre, both painted in 1865. The God's Acre, the lower picture there, is set outside the church of Llanrychwyn, high in the hills behind Trevliw and the very beautiful drawings for this picture survive <clears throat> to watercolours, they're quite large. Now I've discussed these works at length in the new book and I've also pursued further this question of the tension between realism and symbolism and indeed fantasy in uh, Welsh painting by looking at the visual patronage of Howard de Walden, at the work of Joseph Herman and at the painting of M. E. Eldridge. Eldridge's magnum opus, the mural scale paintings that she called collectively the Dance of Life, were made between 1951, when she was living at Manavon, and, in, uh, and 1956, by which time she'd moved to Egwisvach, a village between Aberystwyth and the Chantleth. However, in my book, I've argued that in almost every way, the Dance of Life is a work of the early 1930s. The imagery hadn't moved from that which she deployed on her first large scale uh, commission, painted for a London school in 1933-1934. Um, in association, the scheme as a whole was done in association with two other graduate students from the Royal College of Art. She'd studied there under the direction of the principal, uh, William Rothenstein, who was a long-standing proponent of mural painting in public spaces uh, as a means to bring art to uh, a wide audience. His early conviction had been reinforced by the revival of the form that began in Mexico and the United States after the Great War. In those countries, much of the work uh, expressed left-wing political agendas. Um, initiated, of course, by the communist assertiveness of Diego Rivera and subsequently pursued in the liberal social and economic programs developed by President Roosevelt in response to the Depression. However, on the whole, in its English manifestation, mural painting in the 1930s expressed an escapist rather than an interventionist response to deepening economic and social crisis, a new romanticism. Eldridge's work at the London School integrated three narratives taken from Aesop's fables, transposed in the manner of Stanley Spencer's influential uh, resurrection at Cookham of 1927 to an English rural setting. Her interpretation of Aesop expressed an underlying concern that she shared uh, with other romantics of the period who regarded urbanization as a mortal threat to a kind of sanitized fantasy of English rural life that they indulged. This attitude stood in dramatic contrast to the enthusiasm for abstraction expressed by a different group of her contemporaries that included her immediate predecessor at the Royal College, Kerry Richards. In 1934, Eldridge was already conservative and indeed in the strict sense of the word, reactionary. A distaste for modernity in general and especially for modernism in the arts set her against the avant-garde. In essence, Eldridge was reacting, as did some artists in Germany, where the equivalent divergence in responses to crisis in capitalist society led towards the rejection of urban and industrial life and was represented by the celebration of Heimat in painting and the muscular realism of Lutt and Borden. Certainly the passive mood of her retreat into uh, fantasy ruralism in uh, works such as Rain on the Hill and Telling the Bees, which you can see here, contrasted with the assertive realism of uh, some of the German works, such as Oskar Martin Amerbach's Entertag here, Harvest Day. But I think the comparison is illuminating. Eldridge's distaste for modernity and for the infiltration of what she regarded as, un, as uh, 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 urban people into unpolluted rural space was clear enough, and indeed quite explicit in her 1939 mural, uh, Exploitation of the Country, which you can see here. <clears throat> 
she stood with those like um, Clough Williams Ellis and his friends in the Council for the Preservation of Rural England, who were more distressed by the proliferation of suburban bungalows uh, in England than by the living conditions of unemployed industrial workers. We must remember that this is the period of the crass sentiments of John Betjeman's Come Friendly Bombs and Fall on Slough, written in the same year as the fascist bombing of Guernica. Among the most prominent ruralist reactionaries of the period in England was the writer Henry Williamson, best known now for his Tarka the Otter, published in 1932. The following year, Williamson published his strange metaphysical fantasy called The Starborn. It described the birth of Boy, the unnamed twin of his sister Mamis, and of his being stolen away and brought up by owls, who years later would return into the human world to become a visionary and messianic poet. The book was widely reviewed by literary critics while Eldridge was a student in London. It was variously mocked, as I quote, the sentiments of St Francis of Assisi annotated with extracts from Winnie the Pooh, and praised as revelatory. A book that, again I quote, would restore our sense of eternal truths and elemental verities, showing that the way lies not in the conservation of material things, but by conserving the spiritual home of all humanity and by the protection of living things, a belief that the countryside holds everything needed for the satisfaction of man's wants, whether mental, physical or spiritual. Williamson's search for meaning expressed in The Starborn took him shortly afterwards in 1936 to the 8th Nazi Party Congress at Nuremberg and to Adolf Hitler as the manifestation of the imagined Starborn of the book. Williamson would remain faithful to Hitler and to the English fascist leader Oswald Mosley through the war and beyond after the war. Now in that immediate aftermath of the war, in 1948, Eldridge accepted a commission to illustrate a new edition of Williamson's The Starborn. And in my book, I argue that her illustration to Williamson's text are a guide to understanding the dance of life uh, and her attitude to Wales. And most revealingly of all, perhaps, I think they throw light on the unusual nature of her relationship with her husband, uh, the poet R.S. Thomas. Eldridge, Eldridge imaged Boy, the star-born messianic poet of Williamson's text, uh, in the person of Thomas. She'd used him as a model previously in her mural exploitation of the country, and in the Starborn, he is unmistakable in both the primary image where Boy first appears at Mammoth's window, and then in a John the Baptist-like image of the poet as prophet. <coughs> Now, Eldridge surely identified herself as Mamis, caring for, teaching and supporting the visionary, her twin, who was also her husband, caring, uh, caring for him and supporting him, developing his talent. The Starborn illustrations were in fact made shortly after the publication of Thomas's volume, uh, The Stones of the Field, for which uh, Eldridge illustrated the cover. In addition to the general reference to John the Baptist, Eldridge's full-length illustration of Boy, uh, has him cradling in his hand a bird, an image resonant also of her fascination with St Francis and with the idea of the stigmata, uh, which dated back to the period that she'd spent in Italy before the war. Decades later, she would describe how birds, stunned by collision with the lighthouse on Bardsey Island, were picked up by R.S. Thomas to be revived by him, as she says, in a warm pocket. In Williamson's text, although Mammoth is the twin of boy, it's clear that in some sense she falls in love with him. However, love isn't consummated in sex, but sublimated in a spiritual relationship to which poetry is essential. Opposite the illustration that expresses that relationship, perhaps the nearest Eldridge ever came in all the surviving work to an image of incipient sexual encounter, the text reads like this. For you were imagining me, and thereby I came to you. I've seen Shelley plain. A poet is a medium of that sensation which is within the core of all colour and warmth and form. Within the light of life quivers pure sensation of being. The stars striving to create new worlds know of this themselves, even as the poet knows it of himself. This extract uh, brings me back to the symbolic importance of light, which I touched upon earlier, <coughs> excuse me, in the context of the paintings both of Evan Williams and of David Cox. It's fundamental 
also in understanding the work of one of the most interesting but sadly neg neglected painters of the 19th and early 20th centuries in Wales. A painter who in fact was held in the highest regard by many of his contemporaries and his name was Edgar Herbert Thomas. Now Thomas was born in 1862 in Pembrokeshire and he grew up on a farm and was apprenticed as a weaver. Following his trade he moved to Pontypridd where his interest in drawing was encouraged by the painter uh, William Morgan Williams at Caledverin. In 1883 he submitted a drawing to the National Eisteddfod Art Exhibition at Cardiff where it was awarded a second prize and a silver medal. Now one of the adjudicators was the Dutch-born painter Lawrence Alma Tadema, whose influence resulted in the Marquis of Butte finding a uh, funding a period of training for Thomas uh, in art in London and eventually at the Académie Royale des Beaux-Arts in Antwerp. It's often forgotten uh, these days to what extent Belgium figured in uh, the artistic aspirations of intellectuals at the end of the 19th century. Antwerp, Bruges, Brussels were heirs to the long tradition of the high art of the Northern Renaissance and their prestige as places for young painters to train and develop remained high. When Thomas arrived at the Academy Royale, there were over 30 uh, British students in residence, including three from Wales. Among the English contingent was Horace Mann Livens, who shared lodgings with another student, uh, Vincent van Gogh. He made the earliest known portrait of van Gogh and also, at the same time, this portrait of Edgar Thomas. And so the intriguing possibility arises that Thomas met uh, van Gogh at Antwerp. Now, Thomas went on to spend nine months uh, studying at the Carlos Duran uh, Atelier in Paris, where he was exposed to the swirling aesthetic fashions of the Belle Epoque. But when he came back to live in Cardiff, it would appear from the dark intensity of the portraits he painted, similar to his own portrait by Livens, um, that it was his Antwerp ex experience and training that had made the deepest impression on him. However, in 1892, Thomas suffered a period of mental illness, that changed the direction of his life and work. He became delusional and was incarcerated in the Bridge End Lunatic Asylum. Remarkably, the medical records of his treatment survive and they note that his visions related to his reading of the Book of Daniel, an ap apocalyptic text that had fascinated William Blake and John Martin. His doctor at the asylum noted that Thomas believed that he derives his knowledge direct from the deity. He believes he can foretell events from the appearance of the moon. He said he saw Daniel's book, which was the key to the vision, which was a, a ring around the moon. Now, when Thomas was released from the asylum, he returned to live in lodgings at Blackweir in Cardiff, just on the edge of Cardiff, where he would remain for the rest of his life. The terraced house he shared backed onto the Glamorgan Canal, which he began to paint obsessively and always from almost exactly the same spot. The earliest known of some 80 pictures of the canal persisted with the dark, almost monochrome palette of his portraits, but his use of colour would uh, gradually lighten. Side by side with his Glamorgan Canal pictures, Thomas produced a group of large scale symbolist works, which excited great interest among contemporary critics when they were shown at the Nationalised Stedwald Art Exhibitions. Intellectual Blindness, Following Old Thoughts, painted in 1897 and The Birth of Light, painted two years later, caused a stir, and the dangerous word genius uh, was bandied about. Both pictures are lost, but a drawing of the birth of light survives. The picture indicates that it was the symbolism of light that was at the root of Thomas's painting, the biblical idea of the creation of light as the initiation of all things, and not the superficial effect of light on the physical world that so fascinated uh, the Impressionist painters whose work he would have seen in Paris. Light is the source of everything and light accordingly is the most potent factor in a picture, he observed. So Thomas's Glamorgan canal pictures were not landscapes in a conventional sense. The canal pictures were explorations of the significance of light and were given a, a kind of quasi-scientific validity by the controlled elimination of the variable of place. They're all the same view. Similarly, the many still lives of flowers that Thomas painted in this period, mostly set in glass or highly reflective containers, were also devoid of compositional variation. And they depended for their power on his exploration of the luminosity of colour and of the trans uh, transparency of solid 
uh, materials. Like the Ganal paintings, they did not function simply as observations of the material world. The obsessive consistency of their non-composition, if you like, um, uh, implied a kind of mystical uh, exploration of the meaning of light uh, and of colour, in much the same way as Odilon Redon's celebrated flower paintings, which were made largely between 1900 and 1910, the same period. They and uh, uh, Thomas's work suggest a, a kind of an unspecified metaphor, obscure to the viewer, except in the insistent sense that they arouse of there being more to them uh, than objective studies. Similarly, uh, another of Thomas's explicitly symbolist works, Spring Awakening Old Winter from Her Sleep, which is the only survivor of a series of pictures on the theme of windows, presented simultaneously, both materially and metaphorically, the transcendence of light in the material world. The almost monochrome palette of this picture suggests that it was probably painted early in the evolution of Thomas's work, soon after his psychosis. Now, later on, in association with his student, Henry Walter Shellard, Thomas painted a series of luminous small landscapes around Glamorgan, which make a fascinating comparison with the celebrated landscapes on the same scale, made at the same time, but at the other end of the country, by Augustus John and J.D. Innes. However, despite the fact that in 1913, Thomas had a huge exhibition of his work in London, uh, these landscapes, like his more obviously symbolist pictures, are largely forgotten. In his exhibition at the Doré Galleries in London, he showed 137 works, which was by far the largest London show of any Welsh artist up to that time. Among the pictures he exhibited was his, large, his last major symbolist work, uh, The Source. In Greek mythology, the springs on Mount Helicon were imagined as the birthplace of the muses, the sources of poetical inspiration. Thomas would certainly have been familiar with the vision of the subject completed by Ingres in 1856, La Source, uh, one of the most celebrated paintings of the 19th century. And indeed, I would think it's almost certain that he had inspected the original, which was on public display in the Louvre during his student days in Paris. But Thomas's melancholic conception of the subject was in no way derivative of the Ingres. An intensely let female head emerges from or floats upon uh, the dark water of a pool in which it is reflected. The surface of the water is animated by a single droplet of water, a tear, falling from the eye of the muse. Perhaps in addition to the fundamental classical reference, Thomas had in mind a couplet from Isluin's hymn, Gwel Yuchlau Kamalai Amsar, Sith the Day Grinolav, Ir Yorvon and Thee. The final tear falls into the Black Jordan. Now, in the new book, I've explored further the importance of the artistic tradition of Belgium, where Thomas had trained, by looking at the work of Eugene Larmans and Archie Griffiths, and also Joseph Herman. But I want to finish today with Edgar Thomas's picture called A Bright Summer's Evening. Through the Great War and the 1920s, Thomas continued to paint his luminous landscapes at sites around Cardiff and to express his obsession with the meaning of light in his canal pictures. One summer's evening in 1917, from the dark interior at the back of his house at Blackweir, he looked out into the softly sunlit garden. His empty easel stood facing the canal from where he worked so often. In his painted record of that moment, between the darkness and the light, he carefully delineated the black door latch. The feel of it under his hand must have been deeply familiar to him. From where he painted, he could have reached forward and touched it. It's an intimate and revelatory detail located at the point of transition between the confined darkness and isolation of his inner self and the light that created the world beyond him, revealed but not inhabited. The picture was to appear on the cover of my book, um, because it so well illustrated the idea of looking out, but for some reason it, it doesn't reproduce very well. Somehow its vibrant contrasts uh, lose intensity in reproduction. It was painted in 1917, as I said, just as the Great War terminated the brief period of self-confidence that had been seen as one of cultural and for some political reawakening in Wales. The great expectations that many of his contemporaries had for Thomas as an expression of that reawakening was not fulfilled. And perhaps they would have been too much uh, for him in any case. 
uh, as a personality that was clearly very fragile. But what he did achieve is a great interest. And to my way of thinking, my way of seeing, we can ill afford the loss of so much of his work, both physical loss uh, and loss by neglect of what does remain. And Thomas's work is, of course, just one example of our wider losses. And that takes me back to where I began today, talking about the lack of confidence, the lack of self-confidence to affirm in the world those things that are particular and characteristic in our cultures. I hope that my new book, by analysing aspects of Welsh painting, not only as they relate to the wider cultural context of Wales, but also in terms of international parallels and contrasts, will contribute to the increase of confidence and assertiveness which we must develop if the idea of Wales is to have meaning and to be realised in the future. Thank you very much for listening.